All right, we're coming back to the Thompson article. Before we talk about Thompson's violinist, let's talk about her first presentation of a pro-life argument. And she's going to try to refute this, but this is the argument from the right. So premise one says, every person has a right to life. The fetus is a person. So the fetus has a right to life. Now, the next premise is a key one. A fetus's right to life outweighs the mother's right to decide what happens in and to. And it follows that therefore abortion, which ends the fetus life, violates the fetus's right to life and is therefore morally wrong. Okay, now often you would expect a pro-choice defender like Thompson to argue against premise two, that the fetus is a person. But she's going to grant that for the sake of argument. The premise that she's going to argue against is premise four. So she's not going to deny that the fetus has a right to life. What she's going to argue against is that premise four is false. It's not true that the fetus's right to life outweighs the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body. The mother's right might actually trump the fetus's life, the, uh, the fetus's right. And in order to, to, to bring this out, she offers this very famous thought experiment or a very famous illustration of the violinist. Imagine this. Imagine that you suddenly wake up in a hospital bed and you are medically connected to a famous violinist. And the violinist has this, you're told the violinist has this rare condition where their, I guess their kidneys stop functioning or their organs. And the only way that they can survive is if they are hooked up to you and that their blood can be filtered through your body in some way. Now, you can, you can spin this scenario in different ways. Um, so original example, you've been kidnapped by a bunch of music lovers who want to save the violinist in order to hook you up to them, to the violinist, so that you can save them. So it wasn't your choice, okay? Um, and also, we can imagine different costs associated with being connected to the violinist. What's going to be the cost for you? Well, maybe you just have to stay connected to the violinist for the next nine months. Or maybe it's for nine years. Maybe it's for the rest of your life. Maybe it's going to kill you to stay hooked up to the violinist. All right? Now, here is Thompson's question. The, the violinist is obviously a person, and they have a right to life. Does their right to life trump your right to decide what happens into your body? In other words, are you violating their right to life and doing something morally wrong if you disconnect yourself so that you can walk out of that hospital? Well, that's what um, Thompson thinks. You can obviously, it's obviously fine if you disconnect yourself, especially to save your life if that's what's, if that's what's being asked of you. And this is supposed to be a parallel to the situation of the mother who is pregnant. You're medically connected in a very intimate way with another person. And if you disconnect yourself from them through abortion, uh, they will die. The question is, do you have a right to disconnect yourself from this person? And the idea is, if you think you can disconnect yourself from the violinist, then you can, by the same token, disconnect yourself from your fetus by, by an abortion. So he uses this uh, to refute what she calls an, ar an argument for what she calls the extreme view, the extreme pro-life position. And here's how the argument goes. All fetuses are innocent persons, and so therefore it's always impermissible to kill the fetus, even in cases of rape and even to save the life of the mother. Now, in order to get from premise one to premise three, you're going to need a really strong normative premise here at two. It's going to be something like one of these. It's going to be a premise that says something like directly killing an innocent person is always absolutely wrong or killing an innocent person is murder or your duty to refrain from directly killing an innocent person is more stringent than a duty to keep a person from dying. In other words, it's going to be some premise that says it's always wrong 
under any circumstances to kill uh, an innocent person or to let them die in some way. Now, just to be clear, in this imagined situation, we're all agreeing that the mother and child both have an equal right to life. And we're all agreeing that abortion means killing a person, the fetus, and that non-abortion means the mother's, if the mother's life at stake, the, is at stake, the mother's going to die. And the only options we have here are either to directly kill an innocent person or to let an innocent person die. That We have no other options, no other way around it. So the question is, under these circumstances, is, a, is an abortion permissible or not? And Thompson wants to say, of course it's permissible because no version of that second premise is true. It, it, it can't possibly be true. Think about the violinist, right? It can't possibly be thought. You can't be serious to think that it would be murder for you uh, to unhook from the violinist. If in the world is true, it is that you do not commit murder. You're not doing what's impermissible. If you reach around your back and unplug yourself from the violinist, to save your life, your own life. And by the same token, it can't seriously be thought to be murder if the mother performs an abortion on herself to save her life. Uh, and so, um, so definitely the extreme view, she says, is wrong. So the violinist thought experiment is supposed to show that, look, if you think it's okay to unplug from the violinist, it's okay to have an abortion if your own life is on the line. Okay. Now, what if we say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, you win if the mother's life is on the line. But um, what if the mother's life is not at stake? So here's uh, another anti-abortion argument. The fetus and the mother both have a right to life. The child's right to life is weightier than anything other than the mother's own right to life. So even in cases of rape, abortion is impermissible except to save the life of the mother. If the mother's life is at stake, well, it is. But otherwise, abortion is not permissible. Now, Thompson wants to refute this, even this, this weaker, more moderate pro-life position. And how is she going to do it? She's not going to deny that the fetus has a right to life. But the, question, the premise she wants to question is premise two. Is it true that the child's right to life is weightier than anything other than the mother's own right to life? She wants to say, no, it's not true. In order to see this, we have to look more closely. What, what does the right to life really entail? What do you have a right to when you have a right to life? Well, here's one possible account that you might give. You might think that a right to life is a right to be given at least the bare minimum that you need for continued life. Well, the bare minimum that a fetus needs to continue to live is to not be aborted. So maybe their right to life entails that they not be aborted. But Thompson thinks that's way too strong. That can't be right. And she gives us this counterexample. Imagine that she's got a fever. And the only thing that can cure it is for Henry Fonda to come lay his cool hand on her fevered brow. Henry Fonda, you know, an actor, I'm told that he is a really handsome fella. And uh, imagine this, that there he is in one of my favorite movies, Once Upon a Time in the West. He's a super bad guy in this movie, does a lot of bad things. Anyway, imagine, though, that you're really into Henry Fonda. The only thing that's going to save you is from Henry Fonda to, to fly in from the West Coast and put his cool hand on your fevered brow. Well, Thompson says, look, that would be really nice of Henry Fonda to do, but he doesn't owe it to me. I don't have a right for him to come do that. It would just be something generous he did. So even, even though it is the bare minimum I need to keep on surviving, I don't have a right to it. In the same way, um, you know, the fetus doesn't necessarily have a right to have anything that they need to, in order to keep on living. So this is just too strong of an account that's involved in the right to life. Now, but maybe the right to life is something else. Uh, here's another another way. Maybe maybe the right to life means the right not to be killed by anybody. And if the fetus has the right to life, they have the right not to be killed, not to be aborted. But she thinks that, that the right to life can't even be that strong either. 
Uh, so let's go back to the violinist example. Let's say you're plugged into the violinist. It's not going to kill you, let's say, if you stay plugged in. But it is going to be a big old pain in the neck, maybe for the next nine months. Maybe you have to stay plugged in for nine months. Maybe the rest of your life. In other words, it's not going to kill you, but it's going to be a big sacrifice of your interest and in welfare. Well, she thinks, obviously, you can unplug from the violinist. Yeah, it's going to kill him. But you know what? I don't owe him that nine months of my life or that nine years of my life or whatever it's going to take. I don't owe it to him. He doesn't have a right to that. Um, so by the same token, the baby doesn't have the right against its mother to not be aborted. If it's okay to unplug, it's okay to abort. So we don't have the right not to be killed by anybody. <sighs> Maybe, however, the right to life means the right to not be killed unjustly. Maybe the issue here is, is not that the abortion is a killing, but that it's an unjust killing. So here's how the, this anti-abortion argument would go. The right to life involves the right not to be killed unjustly, fatally unplugging oneself from the violinist or killing a fetus is an unjust killing. Therefore, unplugging or abortion violates the right to life. Now, Thompson doesn't want to argue against A. She doesn't want to say, yeah, she wants to admit that A is true. The controversial premise is B. Is it true that fatally unplugging yourself from the violinist or, you know, killing a fetus, is it true that that is an unjust killing? It's obviously a killing. Is it an unjust killing? She's got a counter argument. At least in cases of rape, she wants to say um, it is not unjust to kill the fetus or unplug from the violinist. Okay, here's how this goes. She says, and this is a, a crucial premise here, that we don't owe the use of our body to anybody unless we have explicitly or implicitly consented to the use of their body. Now, I said this is from one through three. Don't worry about that. We, you don't owe your body to anybody unless you've agreed to it. But premise two, in cases of rape, the mother has not consented to the use of her body by the fetus. She got pregnant against her will. Therefore, in cases of rape, the mother does not owe the use of her body to the fetus. This comes from one and two, not from four and five. Ignore the numbers. So killing the fetus is unjust, though, only if the mother owes the fetus the use of her body. In this case, she doesn't. So therefore, in cases of rape, Killing the fetus is not unjust. And, and, you know, you could run this whole experiment in the same way uh, with, the thought ex with the violinist thought experiment, right? So think, do you think that if you were kidnapped and plugged into the violinist, that you owe the use of your body to the violinist for the next nine months or for four months or five more minutes? She says, um, no, you don't. In the same way, neither does Neither does the mother owe the use of her body to the fetus. Not if it was a rape kidnap situation. I mean, the violin was being kidnapped. All right, you say. Let's say that you we, we, we're right with her. We buy it. We think, you know what? In cases of rape or where the life of the mother is at stake, it's obviously that the child's right to life does not outweigh the mother's right to do what she wants with her body. Uh, abortion is permissible in these circumstances. Well, that's nice, but guess what? The overwhelming majority of all potential abortion cases of all pregnancies do not result from rape and no one's life is at stake. Most of them result from consensual sexual activity and nobody's life is at stake. So what about those cases? Now, there's still, uh, the pro-lifer could make this case against abortion in the case of consensual sex. Here's how the argument would go. We Sure, granted, we do, not, um, we do not owe the use of our body to anyone unless we have explicitly or implicitly consented to the use of our body. 
but in knowledgeable and consensual intercourse where you know what you're doing, the mother has implicitly consented to the use of her body by a fetus. She knows that how babies get made and she has taken that risk. And so she is implicitly agreeing the fetus can use her body if a fetus results. So therefore, in such cases, the mother does owe the use of her body to the fetus. Killing the fetus is unjust if the mother owes the fetus the use of her body. Therefore, in such cases, killing the fetus, having an abortion is unjust. Now, look, even if we grant Thompson all the other arguments, if this one succeeds, I mean, abortion is impermissible and morally impermissible in the overwhelming majority of cases where it's considered. So how's Thompson going to fight back against this one? Because this is where the action's at. Well, Thompson actually thinks, she seems to think, that this argument might be sound. She's less uh, strident in her refutation of this argument. But she thinks that the circumstances that amount to implicit consent are really debatable. Now, let's go back to, to premise two for a second so I can remind you how this works. Premise two says, in knowledgeable and consensual intercourse, the mother has implicitly agreed to let the fetus use her body if a fetus results. And she says, Thompson wants to say, wait a minute, maybe, but not necessarily. She wants to raise questions about premise two. And again, she uses certain thought experiments. She says, look, let's imagine a parallel case. Let's imagine a fantasy world where people, uh, babies, you know, uh, they grow from seeds in the air and let's say that you leave your window open knowing full well that people's seeds might blow in to your house and if they blow in you know they might embed in your carpet and grow up and all of a sudden there's a baby there okay if you leave your in window open have you implicitly agreed that the person that any person who happens to grow up in your house can use that house have you have you agreed to that by opening your window maybe but maybe not um, and if you think that opening leaving your window open doesn't count as implicit consent then having unprotected sex also shouldn't count as implicit consent uh, what about this <laughs> well, I mean think about Think of burglars. What if you live in a neighborhood where you know that there might be burglars? And instead of putting bars on your window, you don't put bars on your window. And sure enough, you get burgled. Well, did the burglars have the right to the use of your house just because you didn't take precautions that you knew uh, could have been could have been taken and you knew what might happen? Uh, or, or you leave your window open and sure enough, somebody comes and robs it. Do they have the right to the use of your stuff just because you didn't take those precautions? She thinks not necessarily. No, probably not. Uh, so she thinks that unprotected sex isn't necessarily implicit consent to the use of your body. Um, now, what about, let, let's take for example, we're trying to get clear on when it is that parents have really taken responsibility for their children. Right. And she wants to say that you haven't taken responsibility for someone just because you had unprotected and they resulted. Um, now, she does think that if your child, if your child has already been born, you have you have implicitly assumed responsibility for your born child. You can't just decide I don't have responsibility for that kid. And, you know, even if it was an unplanned pregnancy, you can't just decide it wasn't you know, I, I wasn't agreeing to all this. Uh, she says, no, 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 you've, if the child's been born, you took it over the hospital, uh, you, you're responsible for that child. You got to, you got to provide for it now. But that's, she doesn't think that's necessarily true when you're just pregnant with the child, with the child. She says, if you've taken all reasonable precautions against having a child, then you don't simply by virtue of your biological relationship to it, have some kind of special responsibility to it. You don't owe it the use of your body. Now, it might be really nice of you if you 
let the child have the use of your body if you carried it to term, right? You might be a good Samaritan for doing that, but it's not morally required. And here's a parallel with the violinist. Let's say that, you know, you, you find yourself connected to the violinist and to save their life, you decide, you know what? They just need me for another nine months here. I'm going to stay connected for another nine months to the violinist. Well, Butler says that would be really nice of you to do. You don't owe it to them, but you'd be a good Samaritan, maybe even a splendid Samaritan for doing that. In the same way, if uh, you carry the child to term, you, know, you would be getting extra credit, morally speaking, for doing that. That would be really, but you don't owe it to anybody. That's what she wants to say. Um, there might be, however, cases where, to go back to this one, let's say, um, let's say that, you know, you've only got another month to go in the pregnancy, or you only have to stay connected to the violinist for another month, or maybe for 10 minutes. Maybe, she says, in those cases, maybe you really have a duty to do it. In other words, maybe you don't have to be a really good or great Samaritan, but you do have to be a minimally decent person. And if it's not going to cost you that much to, care, to save this person's life, well, maybe then you really do owe it to them. But if it's going to be a big sacrifice, you don't owe it to them. That's your idea. So here's the bottom line. Each, um, Thompson wants to argue that even if fetuses are persons from conception, their right to life does not entail necessarily that abortion is always wrong. Um, now, if there are cases in which carrying the child to term requires only minimally decent Samaritanism, then in those cases, abortion is impermissible. And also, just because you have the right to get the fetus out of your body doesn't mean you have the right to kill it. If it was possible to get the unborn child out of your body without killing it, then you would have the obligation to do that. That may or may not be medically possible, though at different stages. So, and then T Thompson ends by reminding her, us all that even though she's been assuming for the sake of argument that the, the personhood begins at conception, she doesn't really think that that's true. So, um, that's an important thing to consider. Now, as you reflect on Thompson's art, argue, article and arguments, I've got three things for you to think about. Okay, first of all is this. Thompson says that we don't owe the use of our body to anyone unless we've consented to this use. Everything hinges on consent. And that comes from a more broad principle which Thompson holds, and that is that we have a special responsibility to another human only if we have assumed it, that we've agreed to it, we've taken it on, either explicitly or implicitly. My question is, is that true? Is it possible that there are certain relationships that we have to other human beings which we didn't choose to be in, but which still create special duties towards those other people? So, for example, you didn't choose to be the child of your parents. But do you think that the fact that you're their child creates special duties that you have to them? That's the same about your siblings, your extended family, even the community you're in. You might not ask to be born into this community or this country. But the fact that you are, does that create special duties towards your community or country, which you don't have towards other countries and communities? Maybe your responsibility to fellow members of an oppressed group. You've been discriminated against, and this other person has too in the same way. And so maybe that maybe that means you owe something to them, a little bit more consideration than you would to others. Is that possible? That consent isn't necessarily the criterion for duty. Another question. Although, it's, uh, although Thompson doesn't argue the point in this paper, she thinks it's obvious that you don't acquire the moral status of personhood at conception. But let's go back to that. When do you think that we become persons? Um, now, this is different than just being, well, according to on Thompson's view, this is different than just being a human being. She would concede that a fetus is a human fetus. It's not a mouse. It's not like Stuart Little or something. 
But the question is, do you have the moral status of personhood? How do you determine when you've got that status of personhood? If it can't be empirically observed or measured, how do we know when we have it? How do we know if any of us are persons? How do we know when we stop being persons? What do you think? And then finally, do you think it's true that voluntary, unprotected sex constitutes implicit consent to the use of one's body by the fetus if a fetus results? All interesting things to think about. I'll leave you with that.